Whether you keep them in your home or love to see them in theirs, these are the creatures that bring us all together. Reptiles. Reptiles. We're going to be delving into the experiences of reptile lovers from around the block and around the world. This is the Reptile Talk Podcast. What's up, everybody? This is Jeremy Turgeon from Brassman Reptiles. I'm Rob, and I'm Creeping It Real. This is episode 26. 26, the big 2-6. Oh, yeah, the big 2-6. <laughs> and uh, this week we're talking about, so you want to be a reptile breeder. Um, basically just talking about uh, jumping into the, the industry as, as a business, uh, taking that leap past hobby keeper or whatever, um, and, and what that entails, what you should think about, um, and what are some things you might not even really be aware of yeah, when it's, you, it's before you all... actually take that plunge. Because it's, it's not as simple as like, I'm just going to breed snakes and make some money. Make some money. Like yeah, that's no. not how it works. Not, not exactly how it works. <laughs> but a lot of people seem to think that that's how it works, or they yeah. think that all you do is play with snakes all day. And it's like, that's no, that is that is less than three percent of my day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably probably true. It's just for the social medias, you know. Yeah, <laughs> most um, of it's cleaning poop. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of poop. A lot of poop. There's a lot of poop. Uh, <laughs> be ready for the poop. Yeah, be ready. Um, I think one of the most important things to uh, to maybe start off with is is just by saying like, if you were getting, if you're just now getting into reptiles, or maybe you've you've gotten a couple reptiles and you're enjoying it and you're thinking about breeding those animals, um, you can certainly breed reptiles without becoming a business. Yes. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, when you actually look at the bigger picture of what becoming a business really means, sometimes you'll take a step back and be like, maybe keeping this a hobby it's is, much is better enjoyable. for me. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, and a lot of times what we see being publicized more so than not on social media is uh, is the business side of things like being a, rept- a big scale reptile breeder, having a large collection of you know, primarily ball pythons um, seems to be the the main theme of things, sometimes even reticulated pythons. Um, and that becomes like your primary business, you know, and that's really all people ever see. They're like, oh, man, I, I want to, you know, make a living just breeding reptiles. And uh, I'll say a lot, not everybody, because some people are, are very lucky and, and they're able to uh, make, an, make a living off of breeding and selling reptiles. But a lot of people that do this full time also have another form of income yes be it real estate be it i mean a million a million different cars, things they have a part-time yeah. job mm-hmm. they yeah they're selling cars or their mechanic or something like that um something that allows them the ability to just do the reptiles as kind of like a side thing but you know actually becomes a bit more successful and secondary they're actually income. making a, a line of secondary income that's substantial yeah, and I get a lot of people who are like, you know, you're doing reptiles all full time. That's your entire job. That's your life. And like, I want to do that. And when when you're saying that, it looks like it's just like, oh, I'm working with reptiles and that's what I do. But there's a lot of layers to that, especially if you wanted to start doing it uh, full time on your own and you're not starting off as joining a bigger business or joining someone who's already established. If you are looking out and looking to start doing your own thing you have to be on top of marketing you have to be on top of branding you have to be good at shipping you have to be good at making labels you have to be good at you know all these different things that are not just i bred my snakes and i made some baby snakes it's all of these other things because uh, a lot of people want to they're not just buying the animal for the animal they're buying the animal for you for the knowledge that you can share with them for what you bring to the table for you know you might work with really brilliant snakes but a lot of people want to invest in you and and be part of you know your situation and so that is something that a lot of people don't take into consideration because a lot of people who do animals are uh, self-proclaimed not people persons mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't Very like true. people and a lot of having a reptile business or doing reptiles full time is dealing with people because you're not selling your reptiles to another reptile <laughs> you're selling yeah. them to people, people uh, exactly. either going as to a pet for someone or a display animal depending on what species you're working with or or as a future breeder and then it's all these different things that you have to take into consideration because if you're selling to someone who's looking to become a future breeder of that animal that you're produced 
they're now your competition. You know, the, down the road, they theoretically could be your competition. They could mm -hmm. be someone who you are, you know, you're selling similar things. Uh, you know, they might take it in a little bit of a different direction or something, but they are competing for that dollar that you're trying to get. And so it's not always easy. It's not always enjoyable. Like, it's not just, oh, I bred my snakes. There's so much more to it. Yeah. And and social media sometimes makes it look like, oh, I, I, bred, I breed snakes. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. And it's not always just that. It's, it's definitely way, way more in depth. Yeah, I think that's it's important to realize that social media is a marketing tool. Yes. It is not the reality. Yeah. You know, so certainly we we can we you tend to see people posting the highlights, mm -hmm. you know, of course like great clutch great eggs. clutches, yeah. you know, Hatching yeah, exactly. Exactly. Egg cutting. Um and every once in a while you see people posting, you know, the not so great things like if an animal dies or babies Slugs deform or, in the eggs yeah. or whatever. Um you know, and both of those are literally just giving you a glimpse into the day-to-day -day reality. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the the biggest thing to realize is, you know, becoming becoming a business entity yourself. You know, if you're going to be doing things full time, you have to do all of the legwork to make the business successful. Yes. You know, so if you think it's about any major, <laughs> right, any major corporation that has like a board or a team that, you know, this person does, does social media, this yep. person does global marketing, this person does whatever, whatever. You now have to be all of those people. Yeah. Um, you know, so social media marketing is obviously one of the major ways of marketing yourself in, in 2020. Um, you know, within, when coronavirus isn't happening, there's reptile expos mm -hmm. going out to reptile shows, getting your name out there, meeting your clients face to face and yes. establishing that relationship with them. Um, communicating people with people in Facebook groups and forums. If you still use forums, I mean, there might be some people <laughs> no, that still yeah. might, maybe you know, <laughs> one or two of the fifty plus year olds. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so there's a there's a bunch of um, a bunch of different ways to market yourself and get your name out there. So it's not impossible to actually be successful breeding reptiles as a business. But it takes a lot of work. A lot of work. Um, you know, so then, you know, the thought process, too, needs to come in like, okay, I, I know some people that are like, well, I, I'm making enough now, you know, with what I'm breeding now where I can quit my job. Mm -hmm. Or I think I can quit my job. And it's like, okay, well, does that mean you're making exactly the same amount of money? Does that mean you're making more? Or are you making less than you realize I, I don't After need to make quite as much? Yeah. Right, exactly. And that's the biggest thing is like your expenses not only – the expenses for the animals, but the expenses for you to live, live yeah. you know, your grocery Eating, bills, yeah. your electric bill, your this, your that, phone, your you know, your internet and all that stuff. All of your personal expenses now have to be covered by reptiles, mm -hmm. you know? So if you're like, oh, I'm making enough money doing this because it's, it's comparable hundred. to my job or whatever, it's like, okay, well now let's, let's just say throwing out a number, your expenses are $2,000 a month for the, your reptiles, but then you have another $2,000 of personal expenses. Yes. So can you cover those $4,000 of expenses just off your reptiles, $4,000 a month yep. worth of expenses just off your reptiles and then see enough profit? And see profit, yeah. You know, those, those are real questions. And, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, when reptile breeders are talking about uh, the, the quote unquote business of, of breeding reptiles, um, a lot of times they are not telling you that. Yes. Uh, they're just like, you know, you have to think about can you can you house all these animals? Can you do all these things? That's important. Yeah. For sure is important. But uh, it's important to not forget that you have to be able to maintain yourself yes. as well as your business. Um, and if you have, you know, if you're, if you have a partner, if you have a family, you know, there's a lot more expenses that go into play thinking about, you know, things like healthcare, you'd now be supplying by yourself. If you were mm -hmm. getting it from your job, now you'd be supplying it by yourself, you know, different expenses that come into play, you have to be aware of. And, um, I don't know. I think the biggest the biggest reason for us even talking about this today is because it's it's a major topic yes. that's coming up as it becomes more popular to, to keep reptiles and breed reptiles. Um, you know, so I, I guess a bit of a bit of history. If this was maybe 15, 20 years ago, it would be a little bit easier yeah. to uh, say, yeah, I can make a living off breeding reptiles because you know spider ball pythons were twenty thousand dollars. You know. <laughs> yeah, but dude, that also is tougher because it wasn't everyone who had them. It was like 
a couple big people got them. Right. And there's yes, some true people too, who yeah. made some huge investments and they kind of made their money on those investments. Uh, but Kevin was talking about like African rock pythons back in the day, mm-hmm. you know, 15, 20 years ago. He bred them and he's like, we couldn't sell them at $100 a piece. Like yeah. we, we, if people bought one, we gave them a second one for free because for free. we couldn't yeah, yeah, get yeah. rid of them. And then now I've, I've seen African rock pythons going for about $1,000, like between 500 and $1,000 each. Like, you know, middle of 2020 right now is, is kind of roughly market value yeah. on them. And it's crazy because – Back then, it, he literally couldn't make money on it. He was talking about his Popwin pythons. Uh, he bred those. He could barely give them away. And now, if you had captive bred U.S. captive bred Popwin pythons, you're probably getting twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars each for them. Mm-hmm. And the market shifts and changes so much. Uh, that's something you also have to think about if you are thinking right. about breeding reptiles full time. The market, if it shifts away from the things that you're working with, how are you going to cope? Yeah. How are you going to deal with that? Because you can't just not have income anymore. You can't mm-hmm. just have no way to make money anymore. Like yep. uh, the Mexican black king snakes used to be 50 or $60. As they've grown in popularity because of social media, now they're valued at roughly 250 to $300 uh, is what I see them selling for consistently all day long, mm-hmm. like flying off the shelves. Yeah. So – you know, that's all things you have to take into consideration. I mean, if you had invested in them previously and you, you know, have breeding stock and all that sort of stuff, you maxed out. You got Bitcoin mm. when it was growing, you know? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You got it before when right it was in, about to hit the bubble or before yeah. it hit the bubble. And um, But if you had got Spiderball Pythons 10 years ago and then now you're still working with Spiderball Pythons, Oof. you are going to be making significantly less money mm-hmm. because a normal Spiderball Python sells for like 75 bucks or something like that. Yep. So that's all things that you have to take into consideration uh, when you're looking at if you want to do reptiles full time. I noticed that a lot of people now are working towards uh, bioactive stuff mm-hmm. where they sell isopods and springtails and – you know, dirt cultures and all this different things because that's something that is renewable. People constantly are buying them. People are adding to their cultures. They're adding to their enclosures and that sort of stuff. And that's a, sort of a, a quick renewable resource. But not everyone does bioactive. It is yeah. growing, but it's not everyone that does that. Mm-hmm. And and it doesn't work for every species. And it doesn't work for every species. So it's something that you have to look at and weigh how you can make money doing that because at the end of the day if you do want to do reptiles full time it has to come down to the money at some point it has mm. to because if you're not thinking about the money then you'll become poor and you cannot afford to keep your reptiles and you can't have reptiles anymore which is yeah. not the goal yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah no and these these are really important things to think about you know i know for for me personally um you know when i when i was first kind of coming up through the ranks i had a, a business called jandy reptiles that um i started out as a hobbyist mm-hmm. and then decided to make it a business because i was already making money but i was also young i was still in high school yeah. so i didn't really have a lot of expenses so for mm-hmm. me making money wasn't wasn't the biggest thing in the world you know it's not like i needed four thousand dollars a month yeah. to sustain myself um you know so when uh but but literally i had somebody working for me who made a bad decision and literally wiped out everything. everything. Yeah. It cost me everything. And, you know, I had to totally deviate, find another way to make money. And now I'm getting to a point where, okay, I'm comfortable enough where I can start generating, you know, a, a breeding group of various reptiles. Um, but, uh, I mean, one of the things that killed me back then was most of my collection was ball pythons. Mm-hmm. And that's what, was getting affected was ball pythons. So I had, you know, a few carpet pythons and a few of these and a few of that, but it was nothing where I could, you know, make the same, the same kind of money and sustain myself the same way. Yeah. So it suddenly it was a, a, a big issue, you know? Um, so for me, one of the things that I've always really taken into careful consideration was having a collection of multiple different species so that I could kind of cover my bases. If I was like, okay, well, ball pythons, they're like the king of the industry. You mm-hmm. know, they're always going to be popular. There's always so many different colors that are that are coming out, you know, and they're not $20,000 anymore. Yeah. You know, like that's so rare. So you can very easily fill the the, the spectrum of price ranges um, for your clientele, which is wonderful. 
Um, but then you have the people who are like, I don't really want a ball python. You know, yeah. they're like, I want a corn snake or I want some other kind of common colubrid, a California king snake or a milk snake or something like that, or even a gopher or pine snake or something. Um, and then you have, you know, I've got like carpet pythons and blood pythons. So I've got some stuff for like the intermediate keeper that's like willing to try their hand in something else. And then I have like retics and berms and stuff like that for people who are a little more experienced who want to go to that next step with working with a big snake. So I've always felt that having some kind of diversity gives you a little bit more security. security. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and I know on the opposite side of that spectrum, I know a lot of people who just work with one, one species, species yeah. and they put all their time and energy into that one species and they, and they crush it. Yeah. You know, they can totally do that. And um, partly because they market themselves very efficiently and, uh, and they generate that name for themselves to where they can sell enough to have that viability. So um, it's e very easy to do both. The diversity route is what has worked for me in the past, and uh, it's I like too much to only work with one or two species. I say that all the time. Um, so I get to cover my bases business-wise, but also for my own personal sanity as a reptile keeper. I don't want to ever be like, oh, that's cool, but I can't get it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I think that uh, diversity definitely can lead to more challenges for people unless you are already well versed in breeding a variety of different things. If you're mm -hmm. trying to learn how to breed six different species all at the same time, you're not mm -hmm. going to be as successful as if you're focusing on just one or maybe two. You can yeah. kind of dial that in a little bit more, but that just goes to show like when you were doing your variety of different things, uh, you know, if you had specialized, you you probably could have gone in, you know, a million different directions in that one thing. Mm -hmm. But since you had had that experience breeding those different things, you could be more successful doing those variety of different things where, right. you know, a lot of people, if they're just thinking, okay, well, I'm going to get a pair of this and a pair of that and a pair of this and a pair of that, and I'm going to raise them all and then I'm going to breed them. It's going to be really challenging for you to get dial in all those different variable factors in breeding those different things. I mean, it, it can be easier if it's more common species, mm -hmm. then you have higher competition when it comes to selling those babies. So it's, it's definitely give and take. You have to analyze and look at, okay, what can I do? And be realistic with yourself. Don't be yeah. like, I'm gonna breed Bolin's pythons. <laughs> and, and come off the rip being like, I'm going to be the guy to breed Bolin's pythons because there's lots of people. There's people who go and see Bolin's pythons in the wild who are still trying to breed Bolin's pythons. That's very true. So what are the odds that you, being some random person who hasn't seen them in the wild, is going to be the person to do it? Yeah. Just, just, just to put it in realistic terms. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be realist with yourself. You need to understand that... Uh, you have limitations. You're a person, just like every other person. Yeah. Um, you know, you might have certain things that lend you to being better at one thing than maybe another person, but you seriously have to make serious, rational decisions because if you go all out, you're either going to burn out or you're not going to be successful. Mm -hmm. And if you are marketing and doing all this stuff to pump yourself up and, and really get your presence known on social media and then you can't breed any of that stuff, you know, Cool. What is five, what is fifty thousand followers if you know you're not doing anything? If you're not you're doing anything, cool you know, if you're thinking about it being helping your full time and then you you're not able to do it full time, what is the point? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's probably one of the things that that irritates me the most is you know because breeding reptiles is so publicized, yes, um, and so commonly seen uh, versus just keeping for the sake of keeping, mm -hmm. right? Um, the thing that probably irritates me the most is seeing. Um, I can't even just say younger people, but just seeing people who want to get into the industry and breed reptiles and they create a business, business entity yeah. or whatever name on social media and they're like, future breeder of this. And it's like, you haven't bred anything okay, yet. but you haven't done anything. <laughs> like, let's yeah. not count your chickens before they hatch. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, cer it's certainly fine to establish if you want to have you know, something where you can be like, okay, I want to have this name. If I can get a website domain and make sure this name isn't already taken, I want to purchase a domain and lock all these, these names down so I can have them mm -hmm. if I become successful. That's fine. And that's actually a great idea if you're thinking of uh, pursuing this any type of seriously. 
But um, to just be like, I'm the future breeder of ball pythons. And it's like, well, there's literally, literally a thousand breeders in the U.S. There's just under a thousand listed on Morph Market. So imagine who's not listed on Morph Market, the Mm -hmm. people who don't want to deal with the public and interacting with the public. They just want to wholesale or the, the people who've been around for 20, 30 that years don't a, that, that don't need to deal with the public because they wholesale to everybody that does. Or they sell to people who are local to them. Like, there's exactly, a lot of people exactly. who I, I see so, them like, you don't even need to, you don't need any social media to sell what you've got. Yeah, there's, exactly. There's a guy in Massachusetts I know um, who breeds white lip pythons and he's bred them for like the last five or six years. Mm-hmm. And he does, he's got a oh, Facebook, yeah. but he doesn't use it. Mm-hmm. He's, he does, does, does not have Instagram. And he doesn't ever post that he sells white lip pythons because guess what? He doesn't need to. They're already sold when they're born. Yeah, so exactly. he doesn't need to post them anywhere. But if you go in any of the white lip groups, people are like, oh, I didn't know that. that there's no one breeding white lip pythons in the United States. And it's like, well, actually, I've seen his snakes. I've seen his babies. And he's shown me pictures of them hatching out of the eggs. So yeah. I don't know what you're I don't know what your point is. Like, yeah, yeah. Not everyone who's on social media or not everyone who's doing it is on social media. That's mm-hmm. just what it boils down to. And it's it's cool for the people who are because you can actually get a view into what they're doing. Like that guy over in Europe, I think his name is Chuck Poland. He bred um, Halma Harris scrub pythons again this year. They'd never been bred before in captivity. He bred them last year, and then he did it again this year. So it wasn't like a fluke. He, like, he got it. He's, he yeah, did he's it. he figured it out. Yeah, it's, or it seems like he's definitely he's, figuring it he's out. He's got yeah. it down pat. And, and it's crazy because no one else in the United States is really doing it. I think there was one person who – one other person who got eggs last year, maybe mm-hmm. two. But that's, that's like the first time it's ever been done. But – for other things like scrub pythons, there's so few people who are producing them. But there are probably dudes who are in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania who are breeding scrub pythons, and they just don't talk about it because they don't need to. They go to an expo and they sell them all. They don't have to market it online. They don't have to deal with the customer base. They mm-hmm. just produce nice animals, and they don't really need recognition for it. Yeah. I think that's that's probably another major piece of advice to, to take into consideration for anybody that's looking to get into this. Um, there are so many people in this industry, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if you just rough estimate, right, let's just say there's a hundred thousand people in the U S that keep reptiles in any, in any way, there's way more than I'm sure there is, but you throw a nice, nice, simple number, a hundred thousand people. Uh, you mean to tell me that you are the one person, especially if you want to breed ball pythons, that's going to do X project first. Now you very well could be, yeah. But exactly like r- what Rob was saying, there could be somebody who's already done it and just not posted it because they either aren't on Facebook or they or don't they, they don't really care. <laughs> yeah. So you know, as amazing as you know, I think it was probably like six or eight years ago when like the push for the world's firsts yeah. was like the really big thing for ball pythons. You know, and like only to find out that like maybe somebody else did it Mm -hmm. or, you know, your photo goes up and they're like, oh, dude, I did that last year. Here's the animal. Yep. You know, and you're like a year old. Yeah. "Ah, That's cool. It's going to look like that. Yeah, exactly. You're like, all right, man, let's talk. (laughs) Um, But, you know, it's important to realize like social media, again, is a marketing tool. It's a great way to connect with people, but it is not the be all end end all. all. Yeah. You know, um, And that's okay, but you have to approach it understanding that, you know. And if you aren't working with ball pythons uh, and you're working – if you don't want to work with a a common or more commonly kept species of reptile, that's fine. But, you know, you really then need to understand that just because it's not on Facebook or Instagram doesn't mean that it doesn't already exist. So watch your ego before you you get it, you know. Definitely. Ego plays a huge role because I feel like a lot of people want to be a reptile breeder because they're like, that's, you could be like a rock star. And it's like, I mean, maybe you, you might be, but realistically, like more, more often than not, you're probably going to be someone who spends a lot of time at home, Mm -hmm. uh, spends a lot of time by yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you still have to be really good at being around people and socializing with people when you Mm -hmm. go to expos or when you see people in person, if you need to trade animals, when you need to pick up feeders, when you got to do this, when you got to do that, you have to be able to do that. 
and it's not just oh i'm a rock star I, I look at my displays with all these crazy snakes and it. it's not just that it's so much more to that mm -hmm. so so much more yeah it's a it is a major major commitment again you know i'll uh, i'll say you know like you have to you're, you're no longer working as as one person doing one job you're now working as one person doing the jobs of eight or eight, ten, people. Yeah, ten people you know even if your collection is not that big you know but from animal care and maintenance to uh marketing to social media management shipping. to website management shipping that's right you're your own shipping department you know yeah um yeah. you know communicating with people talking with people you know it it does Finance. take up the whole day you know i was just talking to to somebody today who wanted to like talk to me on the phone and i was like Dude, texting is, is a lot easier for me because I, I'm not always able to get to my phone, especially working at Nerd. It's a big concrete building, so yes. sometimes I don't always get phone calls, but the messages are going to come through. Mm -hmm. You know, so, like, if I if you text me or whatever, I'll know what you're trying to talk about, and if I can't get to you in, in an hour, you know, when I can finally get to you, I'll know exactly you what you're response. trying to, yeah. to look at. And uh, it was like, oh, man, you know, you're just trying to make the phone call easier. And I'm like, I get it. But when I'm telling you that I'm swamped, part of me being swamped is being on the phone. Yeah. You know, like more often than not, when it comes to that aspect of my life personally, I plan everything out. You know, so very often if somebody wants to get me on the phone, um, I will save that for the points of my life where I'm like driving. Yes. You know, like I do a <laughs> lot of traveling, especially when I'm like on the road for shows or whatever. I used to do that all the time. Like if you're calling me and I really can't answer you, I'll uh, decline the call or it goes to voicemail, whatever. You leave me a voicemail and then I might call you in like three or four days yeah. when I'm on the road for yes. like two and a half hours. And like <laughs> I have some time to chat, but yeah. I also need to call back 10 or 12 other people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, and it just it that just made a little bit more sense for me at, at that time. Um you know, and then I was, I finally was able to get to them on the phone, but I was like, you got to give me like an hour yeah. or so before I can even get the time to even think about what, whatever it is you want to talk about. And then we talked and he was like, yeah, you know, this is just so much easier to talk on the phone. And I was like, I get it. <laughs> I understand. You can just tell me exactly what you're looking for and we can, you know, we can figure Iron something out. Yeah. So I understand. Um, but sometimes that convenience on one side is not always the same convenience on the other side. True. You know, so. See, when I, I started my reptile business, I wasn't starting it as a breeder because I hadn't bred anything besides mm -hmm. like my leopard geckos. Um, I kind of came at a different angle and I was doing education because, mm -hmm. you know, when I was growing up, I had tarantulas and then I got uh, Chinese water dragon and chameleon. And so when I would, uh, you know, they would be like, oh, show and tell day at school. I was like, I want to bring in my water dragon. I want to bring in a tarantula. <laughs> right. I want to bring in, you know, that's the only thing I really care about. Um, and so people would be like, oh, that's really cool. And then I would be like, and they come from here and they eat this and they live this long and look at this thing that's interesting about them. And they're like, you know a lot about these animals. And I'm like, yeah, yes. they're really cool. <laughs> they're like, you should like do this as a business. You should like make a business where you teach people about reptiles because you're really good at teaching people about them. And I was like, Hmm, that's interesting. I didn't really pay too much thought about it when I was, you know, young because I was doing that in kindergarten all the way up through elementary school. And then when I hit like middle school and I had like a, a bunch of different kinds of reptiles, they were like, you've got like eight or 10 different kinds of reptiles. Why don't you like do birthday parties and stuff? Because like when I would bring in show and tell, a bunch of the kids would be like, can you bring some animals over to my place? And I was like, I don't really know if I can do Like, is that, <laughs> that's weird. I don't know. But I was like coming in and, and, so my mom was like, why don't we like look into what it takes to opening up a business like an LLC and, and see what we need for insurance. And then maybe, well, you know, it'll pay for the reptiles because that was the goal at the time. It was just to pay for feeders and supplies and lights and calcium and all that stuff. And we definitely did. First year, we easily did that because just bringing them into elementary schools and then handing out business cards and going, hey, if you want to have a reptile birthday party, call us and we'll come to your house and we'll do a program, an hour long program for you. And it just grew and grew and grew and grew. And that sort of thing, you can actually make a really decent living. I know mean, now with COVID, where you can't <laughs> really do in-person programs that much. Yeah. Uh, Whoops. I don't know. It's a little <laughs> tougher. It's definitely a little tougher. But it's still a viable option. You can do online programs. You can do Zoom programs. You can do small groups in person. And 
it's always exciting for me to teach people about reptiles. And I know mm-hmm. that's not for everyone because a lot of people don't like people, but I really like to see the look on people's face when they get to hold a snake for the first time or, or touch a snake for the first time or, you know, get to check out a leopard gecko up close or see a chameleon in person. That's always super cool to me. And that's, you know, a different part of the hobby that is not necessarily breeding, but you could still be doing reptiles full time with it. Again, with COVID, it's definitely put a huge screeching halt on that because I, <laughs> I had to stop doing birthday parties for literally six months. I yeah. just now started doing programs again, um, you know, masked up and hand sanitizer and blah, 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 and right, all that right, stuff. Right. Um, but it's definitely an area where you can make money because it's not relying on that next sale per se to make your money to live. It's doing mm. programs. And so you don't need that constant inventory because if you produce, you know, only two good clutches of snakes that year, that's what you got to live on, on selling those two clutches of snakes. Yeah. But for programs, it's a little bit easier because it doesn't matter if you, I mean, you could make more money off of one program. You go one, one program and you see three more people who are interested in having one of their own. And, you, you know, you market it to whoever's interested because you can do program. I've done programs for a one-year-old's birthday party. And then over this last summer, like la- not this summer, but last summer, I did a program for a woman who was like 78 or something. And That's she awesome. was just like, I want to do a reptile birthday party. Will you do a reptile birthday party for an 80-year-old? And I was like, yes, I will. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. I am down 100%. And, you know, those sort of things – it's best to educate yourself on the animals beforehand. Uh, mm-hmm. So when people have questions, like I've done so many programs now, I know what questions people are going to ask. So I usually try and get that information out before they even get the chance to ask it. So I, I kind of hit my bases. I know what most people are going to ask just because I've done programs for so long. But after you've done a couple, you'll kind of get the feel for what kind of things people are wondering, what kind of things pop into their mind and, and what kind of things you can cover because those sort of things, it's just, it's super interesting to me to see, you know, how people interact with reptiles. And I love that because you, if you can get one person to stop hating reptiles or to become understanding of them, it puts us all in a better position, honestly. For sure. Yeah. Even the people who breed them. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I think that's, um, that's important is even as a breeder realizing educating. that a part of your job is now educating. True. You know, I didn't even, even think about more that. Yeah. so, you know. Yeah. When people um, buy something from you, they are probably going to ask you how to take care of it. Even if they've mm-hmm. got that species or similar things, they're probably going to ask you, what was it eating? What yeah, kind of yeah, schedule yeah. you got it on? That sort of stuff. So you do have to have educator in your title yep. to, to be a full-time reptile person. Yep, exactly. Especially if you're going to reptile shows, it's Oof. inevitable. You know, yeah. you're going to get the people that are like, what's that? <laughs> how do you take care of if it? If you can write out a care sheet and print <laughs> yeah. it out and give it away with each sale. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh, that exactly. would be great. Yeah. I mean, if you've got one species, that's super easy. If you've got eight species, not so easy. If you have 15 species, it's not Jeremy, how easier. many species? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of care sheets. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, fun fact. This is probably like four years ago. I was like cleaning out some stuff in my folks house Mm -hmm. and I found a care sheet that I wrote about leopard geckos that I, uh, that I wrote when I was a kid Mm -hmm. for like a show and tell at my school or whatever. And like wrote it out and like, and then typed it out and was like handed it out for like everybody. I was like, Oh yeah, I remember doing that. that. That's wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Gosh, they're not nocturnal. They're crepuscular. They're nocturnal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Is the sun out yet? No. Frickin' nighttime. <laughs> uh, amazing. Yeah. But there are more f- different a- like avenues. You know, Each person mm-hmm. will do something different because uh, you, know, you can be a full-time breeder if that's your goal, if you want to be full-time breeding. And, you know, there's different things you have to weigh for that. You can do education. There's people who do that sort of stuff. And then there's the people who are, like, reptile adjacent. So Mm -hmm. there's people who do feeders, so people who breed and sell mice and rats. There's people who do insects, so people who breed crickets or roaches and mealworms and superworms, that sort of thing. There's, you know, all these different lanes that are, you know, right around doing reptiles full time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, dry goods, oh my goodness, yeah, dry goods. I mean, it's a little bit tougher. You have to have a lot of capital to get into doing dry goods. But if you Mm -hmm. can get established in dry goods, you can make some really good money doing that. But again, that's, it's not playing with reptiles. It's, Mm -hmm. it's 
selling dry goods, it's selling a bag of sand, it's selling cypress mulch, it's selling a hide, it's selling lighting, it's selling fixtures, it's selling enclosures. Mm -hmm. It's not just playing with your reptiles. Yeah. The cool thing, and, and you know, I'll, I'll quote or paraphrase Brian Barczyk mm -hmm. a little bit on one of his podcasts uh, where he's talking about, you know, selling investment quality ball pythons, just because that's what he was doing um versus you know where he's at now which is selling more towards like experience. the first time pet keeper yeah. and and whatever and then selling the experience at the reptarium and everything and you know he was saying like let's say there's i'll go back to that number a hundred thousand people that are willing to invest some good money into mm -hmm. a, a ball python or a high-end retic or something like that uh, you're going to market to those hundred thousand people mm -hmm. that sounds awesome because that sounds like a great market. Could you imagine standing in front of 100,000 people? That's a lot of people. But now think about the pet industry. The pet industry is over 10 million. Yes. You know, so when you're thinking about marketing, do you want to market to 100,000 or do you want to market to 10 million? Do you mm -hmm. want to market to 10 million? Yeah. You know, so if you're thinking along those lines, you know, then you want to think, okay, well, then do I really want to spend a lot of time trying to create the newest, coolest ball python? Or do do I maybe want to, like, have a rack of, like, albinos and pides and leucistics and whatever and, like, breed those things so I can sell, you know, those? Yeah. And, you know, those giving those people that first-time experience where, you know, not saying that you don't have the opportunity to be fulfilled because you can obviously breed whatever the heck you want, you know, but... um if you know that you're like, okay, well, I'd rather market to that bigger group of people, you know, um, then you're setting yourself up, I think, for a, a better chance of success yes. just by sheer number of people you're marketing to. Mm -hmm. You know, the challenge then comes into, okay, well, who's your competition? If you're talking about live animals, you know, obviously Brian Barczyk. Mm -hmm. you know, is, is capitalizing on that market right now. But if you are entertaining the concept of dry goods or anything like that, now you're competing with like pet stores, you know, like Petco and PetSmart and all that stuff. Online. So you really, and <laughs> online, Amazon. exactly. Um, so you really, really want to capitalize uh, on going to reptile shows. Mm -hmm. You know, now that certainly is way more involved packing up a trailer. Yeah. You know, with dry having goods, setting you, up, having people, people help you. Stealing things. Exactly. <laughs> so it's a lot more involved. But this is where, like, I'll give a huge shout out to the guys at uh, Dale's Beard of Dragons, mm -hmm. DBD Pet. Um, literally, I think they've only been around for five or six years, so maybe, maybe a little bit maybe more. Maybe a little longer, that. yeah. Um, but, you know, they started just like breeding beard dragons, mm -hmm. breeding whatever. And uh, they were like, okay, well, we want to become like your one-stop shop. Because it was like, okay, well, yes, you can buy this beard dragon for me. But then it was like, well, where do I get the tank? Where do I get this? Where mm -hmm. do I get that? And it was like, oh, you got to go over there. Yeah. You know, you got to go to this vendor, get your all your supplies from this vendor. And they're like, well, why don't we just be the place the where vendor. they can get everything? You know, we're the vendor for everything. And um, damn if they haven't become wildly successful yeah. from that you know to the point now where like i think at just about every show they have two massive booths yeah. at separate side like i know for white plains it's like two different sides of the expo they have two massive booths um and they've really like dialed it in like one booth will have the live animals in the cages and then the other booth will have like all the other decor and substrates and all that stuff so they're like yeah, you can get all this here and then you need to go over there to our other booth and get all that stuff so they're locking you in you know, and it's um, it's wonderful, you know, and I, I've enjoyed, I, I'm not super familiar with, with Dale and Buddy and Mario. Um, I just kind of know them through social media and like every once in a while chatting at um, at the expos. But um, they, watching them grow from, you know, just a simple mm -hmm. single table display of some, some nice beardies to now having full out, you know, retail shelves, stocked full of uh of great supplies you know they, di they didn't skimp on anything yeah you know and they're just continuing to to move they're doing the feeder thing um you know feed i don't think they do feeder rodents but i think they do no. feeder insects, insects and yeah. stuff like that um which is which is great you know they've really capitalized on that thought process of let me be the one-stop spot for everything you need for anything you can get from us and or at the expo <laughs> or from anything at the expo <laughs> yeah. you know um, so shout out to DVD Pet, 
Because no, they didn't pay us to say that. No, they um, didn't. No. <laughs> no, they're just cool. It's crazy they're because I remember cool, yeah. seeing them having, you know, like two tables in the back of, mm-hmm. of Manchester. And then now they've got like pretty much the whole back of the room yeah, yeah, is yeah. all them. Yeah. And they've got everything from exoterrorists to cypress to lights to literally almost yeah, everything. Thermostats and yeah. Bins full of roaches and super worms. And, mm-hmm. you know, you, by the end of the show, you know that they're sold out. Of yeah. And pretty I, much I, all feeders. Yeah. And I think, if I remember correctly, I forgot who it was I was talking to about them, but I think they've, they've even, they've got an, a solid enough crew where they've even done like two expos in the same weekend. Yes. Like in different yep. locations, mm-hmm. you know, which is so again, just shout out to them because again, capitalizing on it, and they really are an example of what you can do being a successful business in the in, in this industry. You yeah, know? and and it's not, and they're not just doing, you know, he's not just doing breeding his bearded dragons. He's diversified. Mm-hmm. He's spread out. He's done a variety of different things mm-hmm. to make himself successful. Yeah, and that's where you know diversification can definitely help you out and put you ahead of the curve. When it comes to that sort of thing, mm-hmm. because you know there might not be a DVD pets at your expo, so maybe you could be that person. Maybe you could be exactly. that. Uh, and if there is, you know, you could find a different lane that isn't fulfilled yet. Mm-hmm. But if you look at, if you go to, I know expos are kind of on pause right now for the most part because of Corona. But if you look at the people at the expos who are making the most money, who is it? Yeah. The it's, feeder people. It's the feeder people. It's always yeah. the feeder people. Feeder people because, and the dry goods people. Yep, but and the dry goods people, people for sure. Feeder people for sure because every person that buys a snake's got to feed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, every person that buys a lizard or a frog has to feed it. Mm-hmm. You might you might not have the frog that you know this one customer is looking for, but when they find that frog, they got to feed it later. Yep. So the people who are are seriously making the money and and who are really crushing it are not even the reptiles. It's the That's reptile true. adjacent people, the people yeah. who are breeding rodents, mice, and rats, the people who are breeding African soft furs, the people who are breeding dubia roaches. Dubia roaches are insanely popular. They're worth mm-hmm. their weight in platinum. Like, yeah. literally, <laughs> yeah. it's ridiculous. I see cups of dubia roaches selling for 40 and $50, and I'm like, the ro- a cockroach? That's, that's what's yeah. getting $50? freaking cockroach. <laughs> but, you know, because they're so popular as feeders... Because they're so popular as feeders, they you can't keep them in stock. It's hard to keep them in stock, especially if you price them, you know, decent. You those people are making hand over fist money at every expo, every single expo. They're making money, and you can't shake a fist at that because you know they are making that money to be able to pay their bills, and they are getting to keep the reptiles that they want to work with. They are capitalizing on that. You know that niche, mm-hmm. per se, uh, that that opportunity, that business opportunity that hasn't been filled yet. I think yeah. that there's a huge opportunity still in feeders for people to make some serious money. There, there certainly will be forever. You know, and yeah. and I mean, even if you're not thinking about the expos, you know, because I know in certain regions, you know, sometimes people will have like contracts with the local expos that they can be the only feeder salespeople, yep. whatever. And that's you know that's great if you can satisfy that niche and and lock it down by all means, freaking crush it. Um, you know, but going far beyond that, or a little beyond that is, uh, you know, if you're breeding feeders, um, you, and you want to breed reptiles also, there's no reason why you can't do both. And yep. in doing both, you kind of set yourself up to consistently gain that that clientele, you know? So you sell somebody a snake or whatever, and you say, oh, if you spend, you know, $500 or more on a reptile, um, you'll get 15 to 25 percent off your next rodent orders for the next mm-hmm. two months, you know, from me. Mm-hmm. Um, and vice versa, if you spend over 500 dollars in rodents, here's 20 percent off your next reptile from me, you know, yes. so you can bounce back and forth for that. And you know, you, you run sales and stuff like that. But I think exactly what you're just saying is probably the most important thing in any business. You need to ask yourself a question, and that's generally that question is. How can I solve this problem? Yes. So isolating a problem or something that you're like, huh, if I had blank, I would buy it. Or if I saw blank, I, saw blank I would buy it. saw blank for sale, I would buy yeah. it. Yeah. And then look around. Does anybody sell that? Does anybody in your area sell that? No. Okay. Maybe I should sell that. Yes. Cool. How can I go about selling that? Mm-hmm. So, you know, if, if feeders 
happens to be one of those things in your Almost area where is. you're just like, yeah, which, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, where it's like, man, I know like there's a lot of reptile keepers in this area and like a lot of them are like, you're ordering online and, and getting it shipped to them, which, you know, obviously is certainly fine or, you know, like, man, every time of year there's always a shortage of mice, of mice or always small mice rats or during whatever. During ball python season. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then you know, medium rats during ball python breeding, breeding season. Breeding season, <laughs> exactly. It always happens around yeah. the same time every year. So suddenly if you can be like, hey, okay, well, what are those breeders doing uh, that I can maybe do differently so that I can sell during the times when there's usually a lull mm-hmm. in activity? You know, so sometimes, like, if you're breeding rodents, you know, temperatures are a big thing, making sure your stuff doesn't get too hot. So maybe the uh, rodent breeders near you don't use an AC in their outbuilding. So they're just using fans. And when the temperature gets too hot, the mice stop breeding because mice do that. So maybe you say, hey, you know what? I'm willing to throw an AC in the area I'm breeding rodents or my mice so it can keep the temperatures down. Put that investment in. I'm going to put that investment in, that electricity. I'm going to do that because if I can off, I'll I'll offset the cost because I'll be able to sell mice Mm -hmm. when nobody else has mice to sell. Yes. You know, so little things like that can go a long way. You know, so I mean, dude, you know, maybe you might, you know, for the eight months out of the year where it's not crushing warm, you know, your sales are average for your mice. And then those four months out of the year when people are failing at finding mice, you're booming. Yes. Business is booming. And those four months could make enough money for your entire year. Yes. You know, like those are the kind of things that you, you learn, you tweak, you figure out along the way. And uh, if you're successful at, at doing that, which it's pretty hard to be unsuccessful breeding rodents. Uh, yeah. There are ways you can really mess that up, yeah. but, but for the most part, it's pretty simple to yeah. do. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I don't know. Mice so, are more tricky than rats. That is true. They will eat each other. That is very true. For no reason. For no reason at all. Um, like, um, I don't like the way that lights turn on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> eat you. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, but it, it's just, it really is about finding those, finding ways to answer those questions and, and figure out the, uh, the answers to those, those questions as a as the keeper you know and you can even you survey your other keeper buddies mm-hmm. that are in the area like hey like what's what's what do something you need you, yeah what's something that you need that you often struggle to get yeah you know um a lot of people who are breeding they need live feeders for their babies mm-hmm. and to get them established especially ball pythons a lot of them don't want to take frozen so yep. offering live for those first two three four meals it's is key. key to getting them rolling and then you can sell them sooner mm-hmm. but if you don't have access to live feeders, a lot of people are buying, you know, just buying rodents from big box pet stores or even from local pet stores. They might not be able to get 20 or 30 hopper mice all yeah. at one go. Or if they can, it's ridiculously expensive. expensive. So expensive. You know, just think about think about that retail markup. What is like a medium rat retail is like seven plus dollars or, or, or more. So, yeah. Or more, you know, seven so, to nine dollars or something. Yeah. And so and like adult mice are like three fifty to five dollars, depending on where Crazy. you're getting it from for a single adult mouse. Yeah. So now if you need 40 or 50. Yeah. That adds up real quick. R- really fast. Real, real quick. Um, you know, so all all things to really think about, you know, and I know we're just kind of like going off on various tangents about this, but um it's it's really important to know that uh, first of all, it's okay to just keep your reptiles. Yes. You don't need to breed them. That's fine. If you want to breed them, cool. Nobody is saying you can't do that. Um, but uh, it's important to actually think about the realizations of is becoming a business and doing it full time uh, a valid and uh, plausible thing for you to do. When you first start thinking about it, you know, like having the um, the gumption to just be like, I'm just getting into this. I've only been in it for a year and a half. I want to become full time. You know, I want to be doing this full time. You know, have you been to a large scale reptile facility? Have you ever gotten to experience that in like in person, not just seeing it on YouTube? You know, because, again, what you see on social media is not the day to day reality. Yeah. You know, it's just not. Um you know, and going to visit some place once is not seeing the day-to-day reality. Yeah. You know, it's a great way to get uh, a a daily a, a dose, you know, of that, and just be like, "Whoa, this is a lot of work." You know, mm-hmm. but um, personally, like I remember, and I, I think I've said this a few different times on on the the podcast, 
when I went to BHB in 2011. That's um, way before the downsize happened mm -hmm. that, that Brian did. He was like cranking out reptiles. Like that was what he was doing. Um, going to a 15,000 square foot facility of nothing but reptiles. And I was there for a week. I was mm -hmm. there every day for a week. Uh, so getting to see that daily grind for a week, mm -hmm. I was like, whoa. Yeah. You know, and it started from the crack of dawn through into the night, mm -hmm. you know, and it was like no rest. You know, your staff worked there a regular, you know, regular work day. But, you know, like Brian and, and Lori were like crushing, mm -hmm. you know, all day from the time they got up to the time they went to bed. It was work, 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 work. And, um, and that's just what it took. Yeah. You know, that's that's what it took. Um, yeah, don't you know, expect it to be a nine to five. Don't expect it to yeah, be yeah. an eight hour. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but that Job. for me, that was the moment when I was like, okay, I'm I'm willing to still do something like this full time, but I'm not willing to do anything on this scale. Yeah, like this has really helped me put into perspective what I'm willing to deal with. Yeah, you know, because um, I didn't want to be responsible for people's paychecks, mm -hmm. anything like that. It's like, man, this business is is sketchy enough as it is to be able to pay your own bills. Yeah. you know, now I got to be responsible for how many other people's bills? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, not yeah. for me. You know, so realizing that, I was like, okay, if I am at a point where like I and maybe one person couldn't handle it, you know, one person that I could be like, hey, come by you know, every weekend and I'll throw you, you know, a couple hundred bucks, come by for like, you know, six to eight hours mm -hmm. and help me do some things. If I can't do it with that, I don't want to do it. Yeah. You know, like that's my absolute cap. And um, for me, I know that's what what works. And that doesn't mean that it certainly isn't full time because it feels like it's full time <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> you know, um, especially working full time. Yeah. On top of it, you know, that's when it, that's when it's really, really tough. Um, you know, talking to a buddy of mine uh, a couple of weeks ago, he's like, man, I really need to, uh, he's working to, to build up to the point to be able to do it full time. And uh, he's like, man, if I can get my full time job, my current full time job down to part time, it would give me so much more time to do what yes. I need to do here. And, you know, I'm, I'm making enough money where I can feel comfortable doing that, mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, make you know make it happen do it. You yeah know, just do go it. for it and do it and uh he's like i'm just i'm, I'm, a, little, I'm just a little hesitant you know and i'm like i get it dude you know i 100 percent get it but um if you have the flexibility to do that part-time where you can not necessarily be one foot in one foot out but gearing yourself up you know it, it's, it's a transition it's yeah. not like a just drop and do it and exactly a lot of times exactly. you want to just make transitional steps to yeah. get there yeah it's it's irresponsible to just be like Drop everything and breed snakes. Yeah. It, yeah. It's irresponsible to that, to do that as just to yourself yes. as a person who has bills to pay, who may have a family to take care of. Unless your spouse is cranking it yeah. and making some good money <laughs> and it's like, baby, sure, go for whatever. your dreams. Yeah, do you know, whatever. Like, whatever, then God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't me. But uh, yeah, that ain't me. Sorry. Um, you know, so so being being aware of that is important, you know, and if you can put yourself in a situation where you can work part time, make make the right amount of money you need with that and then uh, take that extra time to build up the business you were trying to build up, go for it. And when you finally have hit that threshold of like, I'm making the money I need to make to be able to do this full time, cover all my expenses, whatever, then go for it, you know. Um, and don't don't jeopard, don't jip yourself on any other opportunities to generate other forms of income on the side because the industry can be can come and go in waves for different species. You know, we, we you're talking about it with Mexican black kings. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we're we're seeing it happen with a bunch of different animals. I've seen it a, a ton in the carpet python niche. You know, where it's like Erian Jives have like phased out and now Erian Jives are phasing back in, mm -hmm. you know, and coastals have phased out. Now coastals are phasing back in. You know, it, it's a it's a cyclical market yes. for sure. And um, as the social media trends change, the market trends change. You know, this industry is actually determined a lot on social media trends right now. Yeah. Right now. You know, and that and that certainly 
may change. It was funny, know? like it, back when Reptiles Magazine was like really popular, and there wasn't a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of online stuff. When Reptiles Magazine did a you know full spread on blood pythons, it was like, oh man, people really wanted blood pythons. And then you know they did frill dragons, and people were like, oh, I can't keep frill dragons in the stock. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's interesting when people learn about new things. A lot of times they get it invested and interested in it yeah exactly and dude for me like looking at it i'm like if i ever can't do it by myself it's too much for me i don't want to do it yeah like it's just i've gotten to that point in my career now where it's like i just want to work with what i like if mm-hmm. i have to get additional help doing that i'm doing too much yeah because i don't want to feel like i have to even bring in other people to to be able to work my collection mm-hmm. like i don't I've worked with so many big collections now. I'm totally fine with having a small collection. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah relatively sure. small because right. I'm sure to a lot of people they look at you know 50 snakes that I've got and they go, oh my god, you got a, a lot ton of snakes. Of snakes. Yeah. And then I'm like, actually, I got a kind of small collection. Yeah, compared and then to a lot like, of hey, go down the road to Jeremy's house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah look at this guy over here. He's, He's got, got way more. Yeah. yeah, double that just on one wall right yeah. now. <laughs> and and you know, I I don't have giant aspirations of creating tons and tons. Of and tons of babies. Mm-hmm. I, I've got some projects that I want to do, and I do probably going to have a lot of holdbacks. Mm-hmm. But I, I still, I've taken care of large collections. I've worked doing large collections. I'm very efficient at cleaning and cleaning cl- quickly, and getting that done in an efficient manner where it's very time sensitive. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's important because, like, a lot of people when they see social media, they see people like pulling it out, and, like taking a picture of it, and videoing it a little bit, and you know, oh, I'm going to talk about this snake for a minute. And it's like when you've got 200 snakes, you can't do that. You yeah, can't. I mean, yeah. you might be able to do it with one snake, but you got to just—it's like a factory line. You got to mm-hmm. take it out, clean it, wipe it down, new substrate, water dish. Boom, on to the next one, you know, yeah. as quick as possible because otherwise it's cutting into your time and your time is your money mm-hmm. is what it boils down to. Exactly. You have to, when people see places like Nerd uh, and they're like, oh man, you get to like work with snakes all day. And it's like, if you knew how much it was more like a factory, like not, not like a factory pumping things out, but a factory in the terms of cleaning where we're like, okay, do this tub, clean it out, clean the water dish. Okay, paper it, put the snake back, next, next tub. You don't mm-hmm. spend a lot of time looking at the snake. You don't spend a lot of time socializing with that particular ball python. You yeah, know, yeah, the, yeah. the monitor people get to work a little bit more with socialization and, and doing that sort of stuff. But you still have a lot of stuff to clean. So you have to be yeah. very time sensitive on your cleaning schedule and how you work with things. And that plays a role in your own personal collection as well. You have to mm-hmm. manage your time very efficiently to the point where, you know, if you if you're deciding to do this full time, you're probably going to need to have a lot of animals and you need to be efficient at cleaning them effectively and in a very timely manner yeah getting yourself into a routine for cleaning is certainly helpful and feeding for sure not as much feeding but mostly cleaning (laughs) yeah yeah um yeah it it plays it plays a major role time management plays a major role you know um so like i i've i've talked to a couple different people that have larger collections than i maybe triple the size of a collection of mine and they're they might have it split between like two or three different rooms just yeah. because they don't have, they ideally like they like have it in a basement, but instead they have like three spare rooms that they've just kind of like thrown stuff into. And they're like, yeah, I try to break everything down uh, into three days. So one day I'm in this, this room, room and I get everything done in this room. The next day I'm in the next room and I do blah, blah, blah. And then on the fourth day I'm going through and I'm feeding everything. Yep. You know, and, and checking then waters. checking water, you know, he's like, then the, the rest of the days of the week I can go through, I can check, I'm checking waters, you know, spot checking animals that might have, you know, if you work with colubrids, you're and spot breeding, checking every day. Breeding season going crazy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, um, and those are those moments where you can be like, okay, it's, you know, the fifth day of this rotation and everything's been fed, you know, everything ate the other day, whatever, whatever. Now, you know what? Let me make a YouTube video. Yeah. Or now let me take a whole bunch of pictures of stuff that either needs to go up for sale or so I can have a little bit of a backlog of content for posting on Instagram. So I'm not like rushing to find the next post or, you know, I'm not going to leave my social media high and dry for X amount of days. You know, those are really some of the key elements um, to, to being successful when it comes to that time management aspect, you know, because if you're the person that is doing it all, you know, even if you have the help of, of say, a spouse or, uh, or you, you, you know, you call a buddy that comes to help you out one or two days a week, you know, even in the midst of that, the, the bulk of the workload is you, is on you, you know. So being time efficient is key 
for everything that you're trying to do, you know, and um, it takes time once you get into a rhythm of it, you know, and you figure out the fastest ways to do it, what works for you, it becomes a little bit easier, but that doesn't happen overnight, you know, and every year will be different as you're going to produce a different amount of animals, you're going to have a different number of holdbacks every year, you know, so I mean, like all these things play a major role. And, um, you know, we, we didn't even really talk about, uh, about things like if you're going to breed ball pythons, you're going to breed something that's a little bit more common, ball pythons, corn snakes, retics, berms. If you're going to breed those, uh, having some sort of vision with where you want to take those Direction, projects, yeah. uh, especially if you're working on creating certain morphs, is also a major key, you know, because it's really easy in today's industry to get sidetracked. Mm -hmm. because you know that looks cool and that looks cool and that looks cool and that looks cool uh but you know suddenly you're like well it looks cool but this doesn't fit into my project at all yeah you know uh and that's that's certainly a big a big thing i'm guilty of that from time to time <laughs> like, oh it looks cool what can i do with it you know mm -hmm. I, but i bought it so it doesn't matter what what i can do with it and then i'm like oh i gotta sell this yeah you know <laughs> you know um so being aware of that is is major you know so like i know for me uh, that was like my carpet pythons. I had IJs, I had coastals, you know, I've got brittles and, and jungles. And I was like, okay, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish here? Mm -hmm. And I realized like, I really like jungles and brittles. So I was like, okay, I got rid of all my IJ stuff. Of course, then they become popular <laughs> again. But uh, I got rid of all my IJ stuff. I've gotten rid of most of my coastal stuff with a couple of exceptions because I want to work them into... Uh, the jungle stuff, like um, I've got like the ocelot jungle jag stuff. I want to throw that into Azantic and, and do a bunch of other stuff with that. I want to do some moon glow things. So, you know, so I, I've kept very, very specific uh, animals for those projects. But for the most part, anything that's uh, extra, I've sold. Uh, you know, so those are really important things to think about as you're kind of going into any kind of direction. Um, for a project especially that has to do with morphs um you know or if you're thinking of doing like uh polygenic projects you know what animals you're going to hold back how many of those animals you're going to hold back rob mm. um, <laughs> you know important thing important uh, things. Yeah. borneos yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so there's there's a lot of things to think about but basically uh, you know the more planning you can do the better off you're going to be. Yes. And vision. You right. gotta have vision. Having you gotta vision stick is important. to it. Exactly. Stick to it. Don't just drop the project because you get sidetracked. Right. You know, and realizing that, you know, if your plans get altered a little bit along the way, that's not a failure. No. You know, realizing that like, eh, you know what, you might you might jump into a project that somebody else is doing and you might be wanting to create this one morph and you see somebody else did it the year before you and you're like, Oh, I actually I'm not I'm not Big that impressed that with one. it, yeah. you know, like now somebody else just did that bit of work for you, mm -hmm. you know, so now you can deviate, yep. you know, and be like, okay, that's cool. But, you know, let's say you had maybe four or five animals you were holding back for that project and you're like, eh, I don't really like that, that project. I don't like that direction. You can sell it and then reinvest it and then reinvest it into something else or start holding back other animals you may have had listed for sale, mm -hmm. um, you know, and now you have the space to do that, you know, so being willing to, to do that flow is is certainly important and, and that doesn't mean that you failed at anything nah. it, you didn't know yeah. you know um or maybe you did know and you just had like a realization of like you know what maybe it's not worth the time and energy and the food that's got to go into that project when you know i'm not really i'm not really a fan of it um you know at the end of the day you're the person that's got to do all the maintenance on those animals yeah. you know even if you do have somebody helping you out you're the person that's checking on everything so if you open up that drawer or open up that cage and you're like eh you know then that should be a sign for you that it's time to it's time to move on you know you oh, should shit. be able to open every cage and every bin and be like man yeah. this is an awesome snake mm -hmm. you know um that i think that's another thing that's that's key too because you, you're gonna get burnt out if you're working with stuff you don't like yeah. you're gonna get burnt out that much faster um you know so working with the stuff that you want to work with is gonna keep you that much more engaged and invested and invested that's it most deaf that is it we're gonna have to revisit this episode because it's there's been an hour already. Yeah. And there's <laughs> and a lot to talk about. There's even more to talk about. Yeah. So, uh, Jeremy, if yes. people want to support you, how can they do that? 
You can do it a million different ways because I'm everywhere on social media. Uh, so you can find my new Patreon um, that is existing right now. I'm neglecting it a little bit. But uh, you can check it out. Uh, just go to patreon.com slash brassmanreptiles. Once I get up to, I'm just under 10 patrons right now, I think, oh, cool. if I remember correctly. So once I get up to 10, I'll be doing live streams and stuff. I'm just kind of waiting for the magic number 10. Uh, and I can start doing that. Um, you guys will start. I've got some gigs coming up. Ooh. Yay. Thank God COVID <laughs> is releasing a tiny bit of her grip. Um, so if you guys want to see some behind the scenes stuff from some gigs, as well as uh, behind the scenes stuff from my reptile room, I'll be posting both things uh, as that's happening over on Patreon. So you can go find that out. Um, you can also find me on Instagram at Brassman Reptiles, Facebook Brassman Reptiles, Twitter at Brassman Rep. Let me see, am I forgetting anywhere else? Uh, YouTube, Brassman Reptiles, mm -hmm. and I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that's it. I think that we should make an OnlyFans for Reptile Talk. Oof. I'm nervous about <laughs> this proposition. Not nudes, not nudes, you nasties. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be a cool place for people who are fans of the show where we can kind of post some behind-the-scenes stuff like our breeding projects. That's and, true. And some of the stuff that we've been talking about on the show and, and that sort of stuff. I think that, that could be really cool and interesting and make it like a low, you know, just a little – Something we got reptile talk stickers in. Yes, and we do have some t-shirts available as well. Yes. So if you're interested in those, either message us on the reptile talk Instagram. It's at reptile dot talk, uh, or you can message Jeremy or I privately also to get those. Yes, and then uh, what else? We got the stickers. We have more t-shirts coming soon. And There's some other things that might be. Coming I was thinking through. about wristbands. Wristbands are cool. Wristbands, wristbands are, are cool. cool. I, I will say I my real quick, if you message us at reptile.talk and we don't respond right away because you're not uh, – We share it. Yeah. Um, leave a comment on a post yep. or send us a message on one of our Private Instagrams yep. um, because we're we're not only on the Reptile Talk Instagram. I think we're we both manage four like four or five Instagram different accounts. accounts. Yep. Uh, so sometimes we miss notifications. So uh, just be a little bit of a pest and, uh, and we'll And let us know. You. We'll hook you yeah. up. And if you're looking to find out more about me, you can find me on Instagram at Rob is Creeping at Real. You can find me on Twitter at Rob is Creeping. I'm on YouTube. I think it's Creeping at Real with Rob on YouTube. And, yeah, keep an eye out. I think that we should do something fun with that. So Bam. We'll see you guys next time, and thank you for enjoying the show. See ya.